Good morning. Good evening. Good day. Good Lord. Hey, when do you guys listen to podcasts? I always listen to them in the car. Sometimes I listen when I'm getting ready for the day in the morning, for the day ahead. Especially if it's just like a short podcast or it's a segment I really want to hear. I think I can squeeze in those minutes of it. I don't put the big important ones on during that time because I'm afraid I'll miss something. When the shower water is going strong. Long trips are really good for podcasts though. Social media is a wreck these days because of bots, because of the algorithm. You know, I followed someone because I wanted to see some pictures and personal things, not a robot. So stop showing me the things I didn't follow. I don't need suggestions. That's what friends are for. What's a good way to make sure you don't miss anything from the Alabama Take as well as get a little bit more, some stories, some side notes, some behind the scenes, some fun anecdotes? Go to thealabamatake.com, click on newsletter, put in your email. You'll get it in your email inbox. Just visit the Alabama Take in general. Uh, you can click on subscribe and find all the podcasts, all the places where those podcasts are available. Pick your favorite app. Follow those shows. In a, in the newsletter, though, you get a sense of what's going on with the site and our podcast. Is, but, you know, it's, it's extra stuff, too, stuff that aren't stuff that is not posted on the website. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. I dug into some stats recently for this show. Just out of curiosity, I, it, I haven't done that in a while. A pretty funny stuff, kind of. Apparently, a lot of you listen from New York and California, which I would not have guessed. So thanks for doing that. I'm curious who you are, how you encountered us. Tell us more. Reach out to us. And also Germany, another locale for uh, listeners, which is where Donovan was born. Donovan was born in Germany. He's not allowed back, we don't think. I recently began the TV series Eric on Netflix. Stars Benedict Cumberbatch. He plays like a disgruntled puppeteer who works for this dirty, mirrored version of Sesame Street, late 70s, New York. He is married to a lady played by Gabby Hoffman, and they have a kid. And the kid, uh, something's happened to the kid. That's about all I'll say. That's really not a spoiler at all. We don't do spoilers early. So I watched the first episode. I, boy, it's hard to get a grasp of the tone of this show, but and, and that in and in and of itself makes it kind of interesting. It's darker than I assumed it would be. They're incorporating aspects of that era of New York, which I didn't expect. I'll report back on that one. I think the show of the summer is presumed innocent. Could be the bear, but I haven't watched it as of yet. The bear, that is. I haven't watched the bear as of yet. Um, it just released as I'm recording this. So, Some shows of the summer are going to be at battle with one another on FX, Hulu, The Bears, third season. They dropped all those at once. Odd choice if you ask me, but hey, I'm not in charge. Presumed Innocent week to week on Apple TV+. Plus. And on HBO, it's House of the Dragon in its second season. All of those, nice blend of summer television. It's a good balance. I'm trying to talk the guys into watching Presumed Innocent. I don't know if they're biting on it, but I've seen the first two episodes of Presumed Innocent on Apple TV+. Plus. As of now, I think there are four out. It, it is sizzling, this show. It is a remake of the Harrison Ford movie, uh, I think it was about 89 or 90. You know, why reboot something that was well done before? I, I've never figured that one out. But this one has Jake Gyllenhaal, Ruth Nega, and none other than Bill Camp. Just chewing scenery, man. Bill Camp is, he's one of our underrated actors, maybe ever. He's up there, right? So, Bill Kemp, you may know him from Queen's Gambit. He played the janitor. He's had a lot of roles like that where you're like, oh, yeah, I know him. I've seen him. And you know how good he is if you if you recognize him from that. But so, in case you don't know anything about Presumed Innocent, it's just uh, Jake Gyllenhaal plays a lawyer. Mm, 
someone ends up dead. And man, the, the twist, the turns, the who done it aspects, the it's filmed well. It's written by David E. Kelly. If you remember him, he man, he's been writing forever since I was a kid. He's been writing. This guy has gotten better at his craft, I think. David E. Kelly, probably the most recent thing you might know him from. I mean, there's a lot, but Big Little Lies. And this is kind of comparable to that in that it's magnetic, draws you in quickly. I think this one's filmed a little better, probably because of the Apple budget. I don't know. The Big Little Lies was an HBO budget. There's some similarities to it, you know, with with the whole who did what, what's going to happen. Now, with this being a reboot, I don't know if they're going to take the same tack that they did with the movie from uh, 89 or 90 with Harrison Ford. I don't know. And I watched that movie, but I was really young, so I don't remember. I'm on the ride. Uh, I might cover it in this part. I don't know. Will the guys jump on board next week? We'll see. Presumed innocent. I, I can recommend this, though. It's 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 a very adult kind of show. If you are like need a nice little balance from... House of the Dragon, from the Acolyte, something like that. You're like, hey, but I'm still an adult. I want adult television as well, not swords and dragons and lightsabers. This is it. This, this is your balance. This is your palate cleanser. I took advantage of some time on vacation to play a lot of catch-up on Three Body Problem several weeks ago. Uh, the last time I brought it up here, I'd only got about two or three episodes finished. I got to admit, I did start to enjoy it a lot more than I thought. I think it's got a lot of bad parts that are fucking bad, like not good. Now, it, it, it's it's some acting in a couple of cases. It's the character of Augie, especially, all the way through. Saul, the character of Saul, starts out bad. But that actor really finds the rhythm of who he is supposed to be. I like that. The good news there is that Saul becomes a better character thanks to the actor. Um, but th- three body problem rushes through anything that would give me a chance to care about any of these people sometimes or even like them. That happens. But on the other hand, I don't know how I could pull off any kind of deeper moments with some of them without it becoming a slog. Some of these characters are kind of boring. And don't seem to exist except in relation to others. Benedict Wong's also in Three Body Problem. He plays a detective. Every scene he's in, especially for the first five episodes of of this series, it just feels like he was taken straight from another deeper, better series and like photoshopped in or dropped in via some method. He's just much more lived in. It's a credit to Benedict Wong. He's a pretty good guy, pretty good actor. In more astute hands, all this could be fixed where there are these moments to breathe with some of these people. Maybe it needed one more episode, you know, to to understand who these characters are. But that could have slowed it down. Hard to say. Benioff and Weiss, though, are the creators. They did incredibly well with Game of Thrones for the most part until the last, what, four or five episodes last season. Both of these are based off books. Three-body problem based off of a Chinese author. They took this and expanded it a little bit more globally than I think the book does. But here's the biggest issue of all, which is a component of the books, and that's the video game. So this series involves a video game. Now, when you get something that's video game involved in a TV show, it's like the stakes are eliminated. They die, but it's only in the video game, right? It just, I don't really give a shit about that. It's hard to do that. It's hard to give a shit about that kind of stuff. And honestly, I don't care if it gets played. I mean, what is this, Twitch? I don't I don't watch. I'm not into Twitch. I'm into television. Good news on that front. It gets a little away from that. I would have liked to have seen a braver choice by the creators to find a workaround or a substitute for that aspect of the whole video game. But hey, they get it done and knock it out, I suppose. But hey, that might have been a little too far away from the book. So midway through episode four, again, I'm not going to spoil anything, but midway through episode four and all of episodes five, six, and seven, which ends the series for season one, the show really finds a nice little rhythm. A little clunky, but a little rhythm. Uh, There is a character that's in contact with a particular group of people, and I just didn't buy it. Although the actor is Jonathan Price, you might have known him from Game of Thrones, he's a fine actor, renowned actor, but 
I wasn't buying it. Three body problem time makes up for some of the issues it has with its brisk pace. If you can hang in there, uh, first episode I thought was really great. The premise is is laid out, and I'm like, okay, let me have more. Episodes two and three dip a lot, and then it kind of picks back up. Uh, you know, as a Southern guy, I just think our reactions would be much more flippant than what some of these characters do and say about the possibility of what's going on here. You know, it, it is involving a particular video game and aliens, and I don't know. I think that we would be a little bit more indifferent about some of the time factors involved. But it's fun. Three-body problem, it's fun. It's kind of a mid-tier sort of show. The idea is intriguing. For Netflix, I think it got decent views. And uh, it's not drivel. Just leave some things to being desired, right? This episode is episode 201. I thought we'd get it out to you early. Is that okay? Do you like that? We won't do two episodes a week going forward. It's just a little too much on our schedule. But hey, here you go. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get in the show. Let's get the guys in here. Let's talk some some TV wrecks and some analysis of those things on your TV, where to find them, if you should watch them. Episode 201. Let's go. A Oliver Take Projection. Joining me now, Adam and Donovan, to help me clear the wheat from the chaff this week for TV. TV viewers who want recommendations and some conversations. Indeed, did either of y'all watch the Netflix movie Hitman? Yes. I missed it. I'd give it a thumbs up. It's Richard yeah. Linklater. He usually does a good job. This one was fun. A little dark, too. Oddly? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> gl- Oddly dark, and right? <laughs> Glenn Powell, directed by Richard Linklater, as you mentioned. It's, a, it's an odd one. It's really... I mean, it's not odd in a bad way. It's just... Like, who's this for? Oh, I guess for me, because I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I loved every moment I was uh, watching it. I just... Uh, and it took a, a twist or turn that I wasn't expecting. But I was just curious about him. There, there, there's a there's a playfulness to it that throughout it that made me very surprised at something that happened towards the <laughs> towards the end of the. <laughs> if you had to give it a letter grade, what what letter grade are you going to give it? Ooh, as someone with a Netflix account, a minus. In summer evenings, a minus. Yeah, yeah. I was going to go B plus. Yeah, wow, somewhere in that range. High marks. Yeah. He knows how to make a movie that is enjoyable, uh, and it actually does have really interesting things to say about the nature of identity. It does in a really airy way, breezy way. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it it's not like taking your medicine. It's fun. You know, it's it's kind of hard to pin down Richard Linkletter's style. That's one of the things I like about him. It, he he, he kind of does whatever he feels like doing. Yeah. You know, but sometimes he's like making it. money. Sometimes he's like, I'm going to film a kid 18 years, and that's going to be a movie. It's almost like if you could line up his movies and watch them all in a row, you, you'd figure out something about them that they all have in common. But it would take some serious thought. I mean, just think about, I'm just going to name some at random, right? Like, okay, Dazed and Confused, Bernie, uh, Boyhood, School of Rock, and then the animated... Uh, sci-fi adaption, a scanner darkly. Right. Those do not sound like they come from the same person. <laughs> no. Dazed and Confused, Bernie, and School of Rock are some of my favorite movies. Bernie is so good. I wonder if they study School of Rock at like film school. They should. I mean, it's just about when you talk about pacing and character, and yeah, perfect. And it, and it was co-written by Mike White, am I right? Yes. Who went on to do The White Lotus? Yes. Yeah. Very good. He's a good writer. Hitman is like an elevated Sunday afternoon movie. Totally, totally. That sounds perfect. I was a little sad I didn't see this in theaters because I do feel like it would have had a good crowd vibe. And I don't want to spoil anything, but I do have a favorite disguise for Glenn Powell. <laughs> you have to tell me off, Mike. Uh, yeah, so no spoilers for Hitman. It's breezy and 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 just light and fun there is one thing i i didn't like about it 
uh, is that which is that Glenn Powell he's either a year younger than me or he's my age uh, and he looks like an actual adult and sometimes the student workers in the library think I'm 25 this is a, a personal problem that you have with a human being a not with the film problem. okay yeah, I don't want to you he, he shouldn't look like a man <laughs> Why can't I look like a man? <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about another Netflix project. It's a series called Bodkin. stars Will Forte of SNL fame, if you can go back that far. It is about... Will Forte plays Gilbert, a podcaster who's had success with one podcast. He's coming to Ireland to dig around a little, perhaps for a podcast story, a little true crime about... These three people who went missing about 24, 25 years before, the last time they had a Samhain festival, which for us would be like a Halloween kind of festival. Excellent recall on the pronunciation. That is pretty oh, they Well, they point it out to you. They do, but still. luckily, Luckily, I didn't see it spelled before I heard it. Mm-hmm. So that's what stuck. This one has some kind of serious elements that it... Uh, it's described as a dark comedy, but I don't think it's incredibly, you know, funny per se. I think our audience, this will appeal to a lot of them. So before we spoil anything, who's the viewer for this one? And Adam, what drew you in and kept you watching? You both know my affinity for anything in the folk horror genre. Uh, anything that takes place on an island, anything that had, not that this is on an island, but... It's it's a bit of a uh, closed society, similar thing. Donovan is itching to say something, so what what do you have to say? Oh, no, sorry. I was just thinking, like, full core. You, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. You just looked like someone who, like, was itching to jump in there. No, oh, but, no, no. I was just thinking, like, yeah, full core. That's, ah, yeah. When the, when the <laughs> setup is that this very Midwestern, very, like, wide-eyed podcaster... And everyone in town already kind of dislikes him because he's a podcaster, but they enjoy listening to podcasts. I love that is a funny element to it. Uh, Blaine, you discussed is it comedy or not? You know, he's making his way through through this closed society with uh, two companions who I feel like we should we should highlight. Uh, one is a dove, a serious investigative journalist who's kind of been exiled as part of this project and. The other is kind of an assistant who is meek and simply tagging along to handle the logistics at first. Emmy. Uh, Emmy, yeah. So they go in search of the story and start peeling back the layers of this little town. So mm-hmm. I think it's uh, made for Netflix at its heart, meaning it rewards binging or ver- at the very least watching night on night as opposed mm-hmm. to to every week. And I, yeah, I mean, if if you enjoy the Irish countryside and and weird stories that center around Celtic pagan traditions, then yeah, this is for you. You had me at pagan traditions. Some of what I'll say to begin is going to sound a little derogatory, but I do like the show. To me, it's a a house of tropes, but built in a different location and a different paint scheme. Instead of a detective, it's a podcaster. Instead of it's the rough and edgy cop, it's a jaded journalist. Instead of maybe like an L.A. crime scene or Midwestern small town, it's Ireland. Yeah. So what's what's the appeal then? Well, to me, it's still intriguing on where it's going to go and who did what. I'm just never dissatisfied with it. Each episode doles out just enough to connect more and more things and characters together i can't say that if it surprises me or if the twist get me because i don't really watch tv that way uh even mysteries i just sort of take what's given Uh, what i think it does well more so than any of its peers is got is the mystery is well written it's almost like the missing person's puzzle was written in reverse like they knew exactly who did what and where, and then they backed out of that to tell this story of Gilbert and Dove and Emmy trying to figure it out like we are. Well, and centrally, Seamus becomes the the other main character, and I think he's... True. I think there's good acting across the board, 
possibly are we are we getting into spoiler territory? Let's do here? that. I have okay. seen. We're going to at least spoil the first four episodes. Well, I was just going to say with that that mark that I think maybe the acting at times outpaces the writing, or the not necessarily like the dialogue writing, but the you know some shows are fun, but you can't look too close at what's propelling the story forward. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Like the the conspiracy is maybe not airtight, mm-hmm. but it doesn't. No, that, yeah, I agree it, with that, especially here. Yeah, it doesn't always matter because they just kind of lean on vibe, and I think it it kind of works for them on this. If you just take it for what it is, which I think you're spot on, Blaine, that it is a you know the the jaded cop and the the kind of wide eyed. I, I see a wide eyed optimist. Uh, Gilbert, even yeah. though that that hits some hiccups as well, moving through this this world that they are very much not not native to. Although Dove, interestingly, hates it more than anyone because she's from there and has gone to do big quote unquote serious things in London that mm-hmm. she's running away from. I don't, there's just a lot of good, you know, between that her Irish history and tying in actual Irish history with the revolution and the the civil war and all of these things are still you know that's that's the interesting backdrop to me of like how how a people that were at war for so many years just now live in a modern society like where where did everyone who was locked up and then released on the good friday uh agreement go like the, they went home and they're, they're like neighbors now you know how does that work so yeah. that's that's one of the interesting wrinkles here i do get annoyed at times of the trope of small town characters who won't talk to outsiders because that's going to solve the crime way too quickly I, there was a lot of that in the first episode mm. it's almost like the show scratches a similar itch that true crime podcasts do for people who love them i noticed that people who love true crime podcasts tend to listen to any, whether they're incredible or merely okay. I think the good definitely outweighs the mediocre aspects, though. Can you guess the plot line that I do find incredibly magnetic and wanted to watch, if for nothing else? Though I did want to watch for plenty else. but uh, I'm not going to because I have finished it, and I don't oh, want yeah. to say anything wrong. But... Okay, so about midway through, the thing that's got me on a hook is Forte's character Gilbert seems to have marital problems, financial issues, and maybe a gambling addiction, despite being <laughs> so bubbly and all shucks. Yeah. It's like uh, in that first episode, you even get a hint of it when he's on the phone with his wife, and he suddenly gets mean. And I, I was like, oh, that's, I want to know more about this. Uh, I did not want to know more about the cold, jaded journalist who's never smiling and doesn't like anyone. Give me the bubbly guy explaining to me how he's bubbly, despite being broke and all these other things. It is a bit of a Ted Lasso to him, isn't there? A little bit. That's a good point, yeah. But there's there's a lot going wrong behind this this facade of, you know, he's sold early on as, here's this mega successful guy, Dove, you have to, you're banished while we sort out your legal problems to go just help him because and everything about it is like an affront to her right like Mm -hmm. why is this podcaster why do i even have to acknowledge that he exists this is not serious i'm serious it's lampooning that true crime fixation that has -hmm. developed over the last 10 15 years but also kind of kind of making fun of what i said about the netflix thing too right like it's self-aware that like we want true crime drama that's very neat and we get little vignettes of of real people's lives that we get to just forget about as soon as the show's over they don't get to forget about it i do think i'm i will be interested after you watch all seven episodes how you feel about gilbert's art compared to doves because she does come across in the early episodes as fairly one-dimensional yeah and they really, you, they spend more time with all three. All three become, a, they have an arc for sure. Nice. Yeah, the second story I definitely want to know, and this is a spoiler if you watch the first scene, it's 
how Dove's journalist co-worker came to either be hanged or hanged himself. It's probably of note that he's wearing his shoes in the suicide. I just learned that this week. If you're wearing shoes and you're hanged or suicide or jump off of whatever, that's supposed to be a signal that you're murdered. Hmm. But, if, but if you take the time to take the shoes off, that's a signal that you did it. Will Forte, though, plays a perfect, naive American who's in over his head. Mm-hmm. I, I really like him. He is one of the reasons I do like this. And as well, you brought up the, the guy who, play, who plays Seamus, whom I don't really know, I don't think. He is also pulling me along. And, and it helps the show. And one of the things the show has in spades is character interaction. Mm. Seamus and Gilbert. Gilbert and Emmy. Emmy and Dove. So that's well written, despite it being a little true crime tropey, which I think it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's supposed to lean into that. Uh, putting it, and I think this is a reason that I like the genre, putting the story in these closed off locales immediately gives you a pretty rich assortment of characters who it's you don't have to make a leap to like wonder why they know each other. You know, like everything is interconnected. So you're really... Mm-hmm. pulling apart the town by getting, you know, well, this person doesn't talk to that person because of this, and this person has this personality, yeah. and they own all that land, and this person does that mm-hmm. there, and blah, blah, blah. It gets um, a little confusing at times. It gets a little confusing in this one, especially because they do not make apologies for the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, though. There is a character in this series nicknamed Shitpants. It reminds me of my high school days. <laughs> there was a there was a young guy, unfortunate young man, who uh, shit his pants during basketball practice, and everyone called him, and still probably do call him, shit britches. Just the southern version of the Irish. It's tough. Yeah, tough life for shit britches. It's a shame that uh, this show, to me, you, you commented on this, but I think it's kind of a shame it's not on like a, an FX. And I think that if it was out weekly, it would generate discussion and have more of a grip. Even on me, instead of lost within the Netflix content factory. Yes, and I think that that works on two fronts. One, I think it would be appreciated in a different way. And two, I think it being created for that medium instead of Netflix would have led to a better show. What do you mean? I think that this is is built to be a, a page turner more than... Like, there is a very good story there, I think, that they... Again what I said at the beginning, like it doesn't necessarily hold up to close investigation. It's not airtight, you know, and it's not really? meant to be. Uh, okay. I think I said it relies more on vibe and I think forcing it to iron out those details would have made for a better show. I do. Well, that's odd because I do find the writing kind of airtight. I like the, okay, this person is part of the mystery because of this reason. I thought, you know, those kinds of things I thought was good or good. I'll be curious to see what you think at the end. I don't think okay. it necessarily takes away from it, but you have to meet it where it is. Mm-hmm. And so what, I, what What you said of what if it was on an FX, uh, even an HBO, obviously HBO, I say even an HBO as if that's not the the mountaintop, then, but yeah. uh, <laughs> if it were on something like that, I think you could take the same setup and a lot of the same details and it would force it to a higher standard than it hit. I think Barack should have read this one all the way. <laughs> the voiceovers leave. So there's like a little voiceover to begin and end each episode. I think that those could have used some workshopping, just how they're mm. written. But is is part of that because it's supposed to be this kind of cheesy guy yeah, doing maybe. it? Maybe. And that's how I took that. Before we wrap, I just have to throw this one at you. Seamus says, I used to have anger problems. <laughs> <laughs> and Gilbert's reaction, like I said, the, it's the character interactions. And Gilbert says, oh, yeah, hmm. <laughs> it's a pretty good moment. Uh, them buddying up is, is good television, for that, sure. That is good television, yes. Uh, yes. And once Dove begins to have a personality, mm-hmm. her pairing with Emmy becomes a little better, too. Yeah. In, in case you wanted to add anything, I am – the last episode I watched was The Eels Revelation, if that yeah. helps. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what? Just so many twists and turns of like what? How much activity can one small village really hold? 
it is a place where sheep cross the road and you have to stop the car. Yeah, but I mean, the energy levels that these people have to also be getting blackout every night is, uh, <laughs> it's just very impressive. And, you know? and gambling with hippies, violent hippies. At a pretty high level. That was not a, uh, what did he, uh, yeah, like no. eight grand or something like that? Yeah, that was not a f- flip in the quarters. That no. was some, something serious. I don't. It's nice. It's a, it's a beach read, except yeah. in TV show form, right? A cold, rocky beach read. Still a beach read. Yeah, my favorite kind. A beach is a beach. Agreed. There's no fight here. Yeah, waves are waves. Well, I'd rather fight. <laughs> Let's take a break for station identification. Uh, in a second, we're going to do a deep dive into a lot of the show Dark Matter. I just want to, before Adam leaves us, I got to tell you, I got to hook you guys up to something as well as our listeners. So it'll be a two for one here. Y'all got to get on that presumed innocent on Apple TV. That's going to be the show of the summer. It was good. <sighs> fire. Okay. It's fire. I, I'm not joking. It's just the chronic. Huh. One episode <laughs> in and I'm like, Yes. <laughs> And there are three out as we record today. There are three. There'll be four out by this. No, maybe five. Is there any nudity from, from Jake? Do you, buddy, do you like nudity? From Jake. <laughs> this one's got a little nudity. All right. A little bit banging. No, I'm in. You like watching consenting adults bang? <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah, well, presumed innocence, your show. <laughs> Uh, it's a remake, which, you know, hey, do we need another one? No. Remake of the, it's a Scott Turo book, but uh, shortly after it was released, it was a Harrison Ford movie. And I remember watching it, but I don't remember what happens. So it's been that long ago. I think 1990. And uh, no, this is good. It is just solid. It's a, uh, you're, the screen's on fire, man. It's I, I hope y'all do get a chance to watch it because I th- do think it's worth it. And the other show of the summer, though, or maybe it's a little too early when it started to be the show of the summer, is Dark Matter. It's the late spring show of the summer. There you go. We're going to just jump right into spoiler territory because I, I do think that this was just high quality TV. I re- because it's so propulsive, none of what's on screen feels like it's wasting your time. I'd agree with that. One of the things I like about this show is it doesn't waste your time. Everything's going to something. And as they're going through worlds, I'll ask myself questions like, where the hell are they getting money from? But, you know, it's not an interesting answer, and the show doesn't waste. And I like like that, right? Like, uh, It's like just they're smart people. They're doing it. It's not an interesting answer. Let's go with the interesting stuff. That's the only complaint the internet seems to have with this show, by the way. I mean, it's, you know, you see it, you're like, does your credit card work in every world? But maybe, <laughs> does, you know, I don't care. I don't care. Show, st- if you're still with us, uh, it's show starring Joel Edgerton and Jennifer Connelly based off the Blake Crouch book of the same name. A little bit of sci-fi, but sort of like this realistic possible sci-fi. What happens if you make this decision? Does it create a new you? Uh, we thoroughly recommend it. I think I can speak for Donovan. Yeah. Yeah, this is a thumbs up for me. Y- yes. I'm hooked. We're going to spoil everything up until the last episode. Man, I just, even, so like, it's been solid so far. But like this last episode, I'm really liking what they did because it was something I literally never considered. I didn't consider it either. And It's, it's good, right? It would be hard to pull off. Um, in, in less careful hands. Yeah. Uh, it would be too confusing. It would be too... I mean, I, I do. Need, they do need to get numbers tattooed on their foreheads so I can keep everyone well, straight. There are tales. So what's happening here? Yes, there are. You know, everybody yes, who's who's listening this far knows what we're talking about. I'm going to pump the brakes. I'm going to yeah. build up to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These last couple episodes. I had a pretty distinct reaction to that first version of the world that looks as if it su- suffered a nuclear war or something. Mm-hmm. When they open the door of the box, that's pretty scary stuff. You know, the one that scared me, that one is scary. Mm-hmm. 
the one where something's going extremely wrong with the sun and there's no atmosphere. Ooh. That one was pretty, pretty, pretty viscerally, you know? <laughs> yeah. The Ice Age version of Chicago, I, they might have spent a little too much time there as far as the show and the writing is concerned, but it did allow us to build a little something with the um, with the character of Amanda, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it was important to for her to move from, like, I'm completely freaking out to, you know, we, we actually start to see, like, the, the, the capable person she is, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and also... Uh, I like you know you you get a little bit of that spark between them, uh, mm-hmm. uh, between um Jason and Amanda, and you get the like the very reasonable like how would a how would a rational person react to this? You'd probably lose your goddamn mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's impressive how Edgerton plays the bad or second Jason, Jason two, with such slight seediness to begin. There's a hint of menace. And he doesn't employ with the good yeah. professor Jason. It's just a there's just a grimace because it is so slight. He's trying to hold it together and be normal, but like he the the person he is, the person he became, has never had to compromise. Right? Has never had to think about others in a way that someone in a marriage might have, and is clearly used to getting his way and not thinking. And so it's just those like between the way that he reacts when he wants something or the way that he seems hurt when something that he does doesn't go right. Yeah, you can read it in his face yeah. and reactions. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, but it's so but it's so good, right? Because he has to at the same time be holding it together as yeah. if I'm the same person you always knew. Yeah, there's that layer of thought you can put into the show, but you can also just watch it as a as a thriller it completely works as a thriller um and that's one of the things i like about it where it is at least to me propulsive like there's stuff happening that i want to see and it yeah. mixes it and you know it goes between like the like crazy sci-fi worlds to like what are you gonna like more normal worlds but things are still different uh you know to the 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 the, the last episode but it does have those like who am i questions at the end of it right? yes, it because does. like uh, uh, Jason, uh, uh, what are they calling him now? Jason two, the ba- bad Jason. Bad Jason. Yeah, Jason two. I think is honestly what the show's even. J- called Jason it. two is identically similar to. I mean, sorry, genetically similar to Jason one. There is no difference. You could find maybe superficial things like maybe he lost a tooth that the other one didn't. Right. But there's no difference between them. But. They are such completely different people, which just answered. I, I mean, we kind of talked about this with the the first episode, but it just does such a good job of saying over and over again, "Who am I?" You know? Yeah. What makes me me? Yeah. It does. Um, it, does anything make me me? Could I be anything? Good. That's good. Bad. Horrific. You, you know. Other shows and movies can't do this as well as this one, and it, because it's, it hasn't gotten old to me seeing someone go into the superposition box and discover yeah. what it's like to pick a new version of, of a world. You, you, that is you yet have to no old. idea what you're going to see, which yeah. is kind of fun too. It's just thrilling, scary. Like that version of Chicago where Jason and Amanda arrive and it's just besieged by this plague. And he yeah. has to, Jason has to help his wife die in peace with an overdose of morphine. I mean, other shows and movies hit you with that and it's affecting but here it's just disturbing and, and pretty bone deep they've done it I, I feel a good job maybe it's a little sensationalist but he's seen versions of Daniela that he can't save that have died because of him or one version where he clearly did something horrible like he still loves all of these Danielas mm-hmm. but who is she now and Jennifer, too, you know and Jennifer Connelly as Daniela, her line reading of how they took Jason out, but she's confused that he's at the door, Jason, taking him out, meaning that his body. Yeah, that was yeah, that was rough. I, I there, and then there's this. I think I'm still in the same episode. Amanda, she's played by Alice Braga. I think her name is. Mm-hmm. She faces a version of her mom in a world where she is already dead. Amanda yeah. is already dead. Uh, and Edgerton advises her just to comfort her as if she's a spirit or a ghost and it's just 
doing more than just sad. I agree. I'm trying to think what it's doing. Like, like I'm trying to. I agree, and I'm trying to think of like something nice and coherent to say to that. But it it is just kind of like it's so. Maybe the thing I like the best about kind of how they go to these situations back to back is like I think they're doing a good job of making me feel disoriented Mm -hmm. in a way that the characters are so much so that in the I think this is the next episode I they're they're getting a little blurry yeah let's get into it. Uh, Amanda says, I need a break. And you're like, yes, you need a break. Everyone, oh, yeah. you, you, you know? Yeah, I, I think that might be an episode or two ahead. Uh, but yeah, she needs the break. And then she um, decides to stay in that particular Chicago mm-hmm. because it's a very altruistic version of the world. I had thought for a while that they ha- had to, had done more telling than showing when it came to Amanda, but not... In that episode, I think they made up for it quite a lot. She, her elevator ride was genuinely, you know, pretty sad. Affecting, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlie nearly dies from a nut allergy. Little, little harkens back to uh, Jason saying he loves peanut M&Ms but never has them. Yep. Yeah, they did a good job of, I, I feel like they've done a good job of giving us a little. Jason one says something and then it. It kind of unro- unravels from there because, like, especially with Jason too, right? Like, he doesn't know about the tree. He doesn't know what they do on Charlie's birthday. He doesn't know about the yeah. ice cream. You know, he doesn't yeah. know all this stuff, and it's weird. And then, which helps Daniela, his wife, come to a bit of a conclusion that Jason isn't the Jason she knows because he flosses his teeth. Yeah, right. Wait. Like, can you imagine her position, right? Because it's like, you must feel like you're going insane, Everything is going to tell you this is your Jason. Like if you took him to a hospital. Mm hmm. And yet, she knows he's not. What's the giveaway that you aren't who you say you are? Probably killing my, trying to kill my son with ice cream. <laughs> yeah, but, no, I meant Donovan, not, not a fictional. Oh. Like, well, what's the, what's the giveaway that you aren't who you say you are? Even your closest companion would recognize Oh, jeez, man. Something. If I come in and I'm like, I'm so glad it's still on the air. I just saw the funniest episode of Family Guy. Oh, been like, Uh-oh. I've been, I've been switched. Uh, something happened. It's not me. <laughs> the, the seventh episode, which is the penultimate one, mm-hmm. had me thinking. This is a sign of a good show, if you ask me, because it had me thinking. I think I could take myself in a fight. <laughs> That's. If there's one That's person, the question, right? <laughs> yeah. You know all your own. Mo- I could actually actually kept making me think of the uh, the Arrested Development episode where uh, Lu- Lucille and George uh, George Senior are getting uh, their vows renewed, but he has to fight. O- Oscar comes to fight for him, but they all know each other's moves, so they just instantly <laughs> block. You neither can defeat the other because right. they think exactly the same way. <laughs> I like the philosophical idea of uh, how different could a version of you be? Um, if there's good in Jason 2, then how much deceit is in Jason 1? Sure. I mean, he has, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I would, because uh, I think this is a little complaint I have. You know, he, he sort of has his dark night of the soul, right? And like sneaks into the the house like maybe he'll do the same thing that but but uh, for me it was kind of like look there's there's episodes coming up i know he's not going to do this yeah i feel like there could have been not, not that it was like bad but i do i do almost feel like that's a really interesting question you know and like he's like you know what i almost did it it, it was too much it brought me to the edge but also i was like i feel like ah maybe they could tease this out a little more you know what exactly for most of the show, our Jason is a, is a, he's a, he's a pretty good, pretty decent guy, right? And Jason too mm-hmm. is kind of a piece of shit, right? Like he ends up going to a man like as soon as things start not working out for him, you know, he's done this really horrible thing, and it's like you know at least you could just stick around since you ruined somebody's life. And he's like, yeah, I might be out. You know, we had a little fight or whatever. Uh-huh. I mean, I might be done. And then, uh, so I think with Jason, it's almost like, I'm probably going to express this poorly, 
it's almost like the interesting question in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Because Mr. Hyde is, right, he takes the, the potion. And Mr. Hyde is the, the pure evil. But Jekyll is not the pure good. Mm-hmm. Because he's, Hyde is something that's in him the whole time. So I think that, it, you know, I wonder if you could have done more. And, and maybe, it, maybe it would be a distraction. Maybe it wouldn't be good, right? But I do wonder if the, you could have done more than just that one scene with, like, Jason, too, is maybe you're Mr. Hyde, but, you know, those tendencies, those things, maybe, were also, are also in our Jason. And how does, how, you know. Yeah. I There's, don't know. There may not I, be. I, I, might, I might be asking for a bore like if maybe if they did that it would just be like I hated this and it was boring that was too much you know it might have killed the momentum eh Jason too this motherfucker kidnaps another Ryan I know he's, he's I mean he goes and grabs he's a, such an asshole like lie <laughs> upon lie was there an early episode where Jason won and Amanda opened the door to a blocked off box Yes, I don't know if it was blocked off in concrete, but they opened a door that they couldn't go through. Okay. What I do you th- think it's lucky how many of these variations of Chicago, it's not in some deserted warehouse. It's just like in a nice spot. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's pretty lucky. <laughs> yeah. Am I wrong in thinking a lesser show would really toy more with the idea of a world where both sons live? Yeah. I mean, I think we knew we were going to run into it, but uh, maybe I'm just a sucker. I like the way they did it. Where, like, for for Jason, this is like the one of the most overwhelming and devastating things he can imagine. He just mm-hmm. wants to tell his son he loves him unconditionally, and the son is like clearly he and his dad are having problems, so he's not here to hear it. You know that mm-hmm. was that was, right. and then he's got to go on. He's got to take that with him, right? Yeah. Because he's got to get back to his world. Kudos to the makeup department and the prop department for helping me keep up with some of these versions. Thank you, thank uh, you so much. Like at least like the, the thank cut you on for the giving bridge. Jason a scrape on yeah. his nose so that I and can then tell the, who uh, he is. The r- substitute for a ring. Yeah, the rubber band or the hair tie. The hair tie. What it is. The hair tie. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. <laughs> So, yeah, the penultimate episode has many Jasons coming out of nowhere. That got a little confusing, but I try not to overthink it too much it of how confusing, that could happen. I thought for some parts the confusion was the the point. And I thought, like, it was so good because it's like, of course, if the premise is based on, like, every action, you then that Jason who's been kidnapped mm-hmm. immediately starts splitting off. Yeah, and who knows how many? And of all those infinite Jasons, mm-hmm. some of them are going to make it there, right? Yeah. And how do you, as Danielle? How the other interesting thing I thought was like, how do you, as Daniela, choose? They're all the person that was kidnapped. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, how, and how do we, as viewers, know he's the real Jason at the end who's hugging? Right. Right. And I suppose he, it doesn't really matter. They're all him. So long I mean, as again, it goes was the one who got like, kidnapped. Who, who are you? Yeah. Exactly. You know, except you are different, right? Because it's like our Jason, in just an in encounter we have our Jason, uh, Amanda found a world to stay in. The other Jason, he probably saw his Amanda killed, right? How is that not going to change you? Right? So mm-hmm. you're the same person, but you're not the same. You know, you're, you're not. You're, you're not, yeah. And which one of you is real? How do you interpret the look Daniela makes at the end of the penultimate episode while what seems to be jason one hugging charlie Hmm. she gives a look and that's how it ends and and with the episode ending with such a focused shot there what what are we supposed to take away from that going to like the most simple explanation but my thought here is like how can i be sure especially because like this is the way jason two acted Mm -hmm. at the beginning you know yeah. Like, I'm so glad to see you. I'm not, like, my son. This is great. You, you know, like, won't the suspicion always be there? Yeah. Maybe that's, that's how what could we're supposed it not, to think. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, brilliant plan to get arrested so he could just, like, the yeah, key, that was actually pretty good. <laughs> the key is to get to Daniela and not the other Jason. I thought yes. that was a nice, that was a nice plan. 
another bit of sort of questions, which will of course be answered, but I do like to speculate sometimes. Yeah. What's to become of Ryan? And you know that other the the real Ryan is out there, and the doors open again. Yeah. And but he can't get back. He doesn't. Someone have has to, to bring him back. Right. And the only person who knows where he is uh-huh. is 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 Jason Jason too the bad Jason uh huh and it's same seems, same with the guy he kidnapped the mechanic right no one else knows where he came from the poor mechanic yeah I feel bad for both of those Ryans honestly he got an okay haircut from someone who who's not a barber he did get a nice haircut <laughs> uh, and then <laughs> then the last question that's lingering might be answered might not you know Blair the lawyer. I thought the show was going to do something with her being maybe another version of herself. You think so? Huh. I thought it might. It never really did, other than we saw her in the uh, world where the giant yellow jackets are killing people. Yes. And then that was it. So it seems like there might be more to do there. Maybe. I mean, I have noticed that there's a lot of... We we meet a lot of the same characters. The Doctor and the the episode with the plague... Mm-hmm. That's the doctor that treated him in the hospital in oh the first for Chicago. You and know? then the it's the, the policeman woman. lady who arrested him's the uh, the bodyguard. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So they 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 have been bouncing. So I, I I was like I don't know if this is just they're bouncing people around because they had done that with other characters. Yeah. Or you're seeing they're they're the other versions of themselves. So I don't know. Really good show because it could do. Because it's doing two things, uh, you know. So sometimes you get your kind of sci-fi show that's doesn't have the heart and soul. Yeah. But this one's got them both. Yeah, it's, it, you know, you get the sci-fi show that's just like, oh, lasers and spaceships, those are cool. You want to watch that, right? <laughs> right, with no humanity. The flip side of that is it like it is doing, it is very grounded mm-hmm. in these really big questions. Well. Also still being a really exciting thriller. That's right. You know, like, it's very propulsive. Like, you know, so it's not like you're eating your veggies while you're thinking these big questions, right? Like, you're having fun. It's It kind of reminds me of Severance, although yeah. I think Severance was even deeper. I think Severance, I agree, Severance, not that this, not that Dark Matter is bad. Severance is deeper, and one of the things I like about Severance is it's weirder yeah it's definitely weirder but also interestingly kind of playing with the same themes right uh-huh. same thoughts who are you mm-hmm. if you can't remember your experiences you know you're just stuck at work right like who is that a different you are you a different person now yeah and who's yeah. the real you yeah the one outside of work or the one inside who's more is one more real than the other a new look at nature versus nurture so, yeah 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 exactly all right. Well, that's when we return. We we may have to talk about the finale of Dark Matter. So for Adam and Donovan, I'm Blaine. Head to the alabamatake.com slash newsletter. Get yourself something in your inbox every now and again. It ain't bad, folks. I'll tell you this. Blaine is that you, you write it all, Blaine, right? Yes. You're a pretty I- damn good writer. You you made you- <laughs> This is neither here nor there, folks. You got to get up for this because Blaine wrote something about those little plastic swimming pools. Oh yeah, you did that you, take you back? That yeah, and 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 the thing you the thing you said was like I've never seen one of those in the trash. <laughs> Have you? And I'm like, there's a, like an X Files level conspiracy that Blaine has just unlocked here because I have also never seen one of those in the trash. Where just, are they going? I just never What's remember happening? my parents throwing the one we had away. Right. But I know it's not there anymore. Right. Yeah. I Where did know. it go? I don't know. It's cooling off some uh, other Blaine in I another so. multi universe. It's cooling off angels now. thanks for listening sign up for the newsletter and uh, subscribe to us if you're not already we will talk to you pretty much every Tuesday adios